Radiation is something we use and depend on every single day. Yet, for some reason, the word inspires fear. I think it's because of like nuclear weapons and the thoughts of radiation. Obviously, in those situations, it can be fatal. There's actually all types of radiation, and they often have similar attributes. Now, I'm going to try to keep the information limited as much as possible. However, you will find that some of this video does get quite technical. I'm excited about that. I'm a nerd kind of guy. However, stay to the end, because then I'm going to sum it up and show you all the things you absolutely need to know in case of a nuclear detonation. Okay, we already discussed the flash of the nuclear detonation called thermal radiation. Granted, it's a massive amount of radiation all at once, but our body releases thermal radiation all the time. It's actually how thermal imaging works. It picks up our heat signature. Have you ever sat down next to someone who they just worked out or went jogging and you don't even have to touch them. You're like, oh my gosh, I can feel the heat radiating off of you. That's exactly what it is. They actually have thermal radiation coming off their body or a microwave oven. It uses a very specific frequency of microwave band radiation to vibrate molecules of water. That's how it works. It vibrates the water and heats our food. And of course, nuclear radiation. So let's go ahead and look at each type of radiation coming from a nuclear weapon and break it down. Okay, first off, there are two radiations we'll address without going into detail again, alpha and beta radiation. On their own, usually are not a problem. We get bombarded by them all the time. Alpha radiation is so big and so slow that it often will actually get stopped by simply a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be a thick one, but just one individual sheet will be just fine. Beta radiation, however, is smaller and faster and will often pass right through the newspaper, but your skin will stop it. In fact, it'll actually be absorbed by the skin. Alpha radiation, if it hits your skin, will be absorbed there as well. However, when a nuclear source that emits alpha and beta radiation is ingested, it will produce what we call ionizing radiation. Small amounts of ionizing radiation, no big deal. It happens all the time. However, large amounts, like from a nuclear weapon, can easily damage cells, destroy your DNA, and cause cancer. So alpha particles can only be a problem if you ingest them. Same thing with beta. This is exactly why we can't eat food that's actually been touched by nuclear fallout. All the radioactive material actually goes into the food and you'll be ingesting it. Furthermore, with beta particles, you actually have to make sure they don't get into an open wound either. Another type of radiation that people don't even realize it is radiation is light, simply light from the light bulb. It actually is emitted as what's called an electromagnetic wave. The wave hits your skin, bounces off specific frequencies, and that's why we see color. But an electromagnetic wave is not just light, there's it's far more to it than that. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. Without going into detail, again, it shows you how powerful the electromagnetic waves are. On the left-hand side, the weakest of all the waves are radio waves. Like AM, FM radio stations actually broadcast out these waves. More powerful than that, microwaves. Yep, the waves that heat your food in a microwave oven and cell phones use these waves. Next, infrared, also called heat radiation. TV remote controls use this wavelength and mosquitoes too. They actually see in this range so they can pick up your heat signature and bite you. Then, the wavelengths we're most familiar with are visible spectrum. And again, I really made this simple. In fact, this particular range, when you talk about visible range, is not that big. It's really tiny, but I just made it bigger for us to be able to see it much easier. More powerful than that, ultraviolet radiation. We can see this being used to sterilize equipment, and it's also the spectrum butterflies can see. Other bugs too, so they can actually see flowers. They glow for them. Okay, then we get to the two most powerful radiations. First, x-rays. Of course, as you know, x-ray equipment to see broken bones. However, too much of that, it may burn you and even cause cancer. Then even more powerful than that, gamma rays. Yep, this is the scary stuff that people worry about when it comes to nuclear bombs. Yeah, we'll be talking a lot about gamma rays in a few minutes. Let's go ahead and look at the thermal flash, you know, the actual thermal radiation that comes from a nuclear bomb. It falls in three ranges, infrared, visible, and ultraviolet. So much so, this is what causes initial burns, blindness, and in a previous video, it causes debris to catch on fire. So the third type of radiation, gamma rays. They are powerful, the most powerful electromagnetic waves released from radioactive material. This is gamma radiation. And these gamma rays will easily disrupt and destroy your DNA and cause cancer, all kinds of problems. All right, the last type of radiation we'll talk about is neutron radiation. 
When you look at an atom, one of the particles you find within the atom is a neutron. So literally it's a particle that's released from an atom. So first off, if you actually block a neutron from moving, it'll often release a gamma ray. And secondly, in fact, even more importantly, if a particular atom actually gets a neutron, the neutron attaches to it, then it becomes radioactive itself. Neutron radiation can make objects around your home radioactive. This is something most people don't know, including you. If you actually get close enough to a nuclear detonation, you'll actually have those neutrons enter you, change your physical makeup as far as your atomic structure, and it'll actually make you radioactive. We see this happen when it comes to like, for example, iron. We talked about this in the fallout video, but if you actually have like an iron can or an iron pipe, there's actually molecules in there like cobalt atoms, for example, that when the radiation, sorry, the neutron radiation comes in and hits it, it'll actually become radioactive as well. So metals can actually become radioactive with neutron radiation. We call that, just FYI, neutron activation. Something else too, one of their followers asked, what about aluminum cans? Yeah, aluminum cans will do it too. However, they'll actually only stay, radioactive, they'll only stay radioactive for a few minutes. Okay, so there's four types of radiation, and we're looking at the four types, alpha, beta, gamma, and neutron. Now, let's talk about how the radiation is actually made. If you actually have an element, and that element, for whatever reason, is what's called unstable, and will fission or break apart, it'll release one of those, if not more, of those four types of radiation. And here are just a few radioactive elements produced from a nuclear detonation. There's actually over 100 of them. Strontium-90 has a half-life of 28 years. Let me do a little demonstration for you. All of these red poker chips right here are actually radioactive elements. And what that means is it's unstable. It will actually will spontaneously break apart, release radiation, and then become another atom. In this particular case, I used white poker chips to show it's a stable one. In other words, unless there's some kind of outside event on it, it'll never be radioactive. It'll actually be perfect just the way it is. So let's say after nuclear detonation, you actually have some radioactive material around your place, and here's this giant clump of atoms, um, like for example, strontium. We'll go ahead and use that as an example. And here there, they're radioactive. So if you watch it, this one right here will, boom, release actually some radiation, and then it becomes stable then this one will, then this one will. And it's really amazing when it comes to uh, atomic um, understanding, it actually does it with a very specified time that we can actually register, and we call that a half-life. Now strontium, which I picked as an example, actually has a half-life of 28 years. And what that means is, if you just watch this over time, it'll switch, switch, and over time it'll do this, 28 years later, <laughs> 28 years later, all of these over here, I mean, obviously I did it on half over here, it doesn't have to be this half, could be anywhere, have all now become stable atoms. 28 years later, does that mean the rest of it are turned? No, it's a half-life. 28 years later, all these ones have switched. What about the rest of it? Another 28 years? No, 28 years later, half of it. So you can see that Eventually, over time, another 28 years, another 28 years, it eventually gets to the point where you may actually even have some radioactive atoms in there. We're talking about 28 years times what? Five or six now. We're talking about 100 years or, or more. You may have actually gotten rid of most of the radioactivity. There's still some left, but it's enough to actually make the end result. That's called the half-life. So when an actual radioactive element decays and releases radiation, half of it will actually decay by a certain time then half of that, then half of that, then half of that. And eventually, all of it will, but that obviously will take quite a while. So we actually measure things in radio radioactivity in what we call half-life. Half Strontium-90 has a half-life, as I mentioned, of 28 years. It actually acts like calcium and is absorbed into the bones. So you put the radioactive material into your bones, it causes tumors, leukemia, and other blood abnormalities like anemia. Cesium-137 has a half-life of 30 years. It mimics potassium all throughout the body, leading to gonadal irradiation and genetic damage. Tritium has a half-life of 12.3 years. It partially makes up heavy water, therefore can be ingested very easily when you drink contaminated water. The beta irradiation from that can actually cause lung cancer. And finally, iodine-131 has a half-life of 8.1 days. This is an important one. Ingestion concentrates in the thyroid gland. So you may have heard that in case there's nuclear detonation, you need to take potassium iodide. 
we have this for everybody in our family. We'll talk about dosage for this in a minute. But basically, it's a high dose of potassium iodide, or specifically iodine, for 14 days. And I've heard many people say, well, what it does is it actually kicks out the radiation or if it actually or removes radiation from your body. That's not true at all. But basically, when it comes to iodine, the radioactive iodine is called iodine-131. And uh, so here's a regular iodine. We'll use M&Ms for this. So this regular iodine looks like this. And the way it works is when you actually eat food that has iodine, like salt and seafood and such, you ingest it, that the iodine will then go into your thyroid gland. The thyroid gland produces hormones, uh, triiodothyronine and tetraiodothyronine, or thyroxine. And these are actually metabolism hormones. Literally, the more you have of this hormone, the more you'll bounce off the walls with energy. I need more of that. All right, but anyway, regular, regularly when you're just simply living your life, you're having iodine come in, the iodine goes to the thyroid, the thyroid makes those hormones with the iodine and off it goes. However, a nuclear detonation goes off and now we have radioactive iodine. Your body, more specifically your thyroid gland, cannot tell the difference between radioactive and regular iodine. Is there most still iodine? So what happens is, instead of actually the regular iodine going there, you now actually have, well, if you have two of them, you have an equal chance of, well, now the radioactive one going to your thyroid gland. And when it does, it releases radiation in your thyroid gland, causing thyroid cancer. So how do we com combat that? The only thing we actually take the potassium iodide for is for this particular type of um, radioactive material. All the other radioactive material you may get in your body, hopefully you won't, it won't do anything for it, just the iodine. So it's like this. Let's just say this is your thyroid gland, and at any given time, you'll have some food, puts in some iodine, puts in some iodine, makes some hormones, and then boom, the bomb goes off, and now you have some red radioactive iodine in there as well. Obviously, you don't want that. So what you do is you'll see that at any given time, practically speaking, we have a need, we need iodine in there, so you take the pills, Take, don't ever take this, by the way, unless there's a bomb that's gone off, a nuclear bomb, because you don't want to over, you know, it's a high dose. But what happens is this, is you take that first pill and you'll take it for 14 days and watch this. It literally fills up the thyroid gland totally full with regular iodine. So now, let's see if I can get this to work right. Now when you actually have the radioactive iodine come in, of course it went in the bowl, look, it popped out. Okay, we, another one comes by, pops out, and it actually stays in your bloodstream, then it'll eventually you'll discharge it through your kidneys. But what happens is by really overdosing on potassium iodide, it simply just blocks it inside your thyroid gland, so the radioactive iodide never makes it in. Statistically, some will still make it in. But again, we're talking about small amounts, won't be as detrimental. So literally, by taking this, I guess you can call it an iodide blocker, keeping radioactive iodine out of your thyroid gland. That's all it does, and that's the only function of it. And here's what the CDC recommends for dosages. You could take a screenshot of this if you like, or go to their website, I'll put a link below. But again, for adult, we're looking at 130 milligrams times 14 days, once a day. Okay, so you're in your bomb shelter, AKA your basement or a shelter you dug in the backyard. When can you leave? That is probably the number one question I get asked about this. Um, it's actually estimated that you can leave in two weeks. Uh, because as you can see, we talked about the iodine. There's far more radioactive elements than iodine. Is eight days. So eight days, half of it's gone. Eight more days, well, then now you still have a quarter round. But at that point, you can deal with a little bit of uh, radioactive iodine. Um, however, I need to understand that there are some estimates, especially when you talk about this like military and government, that the actual area could be hot, depending on for up to five years or, or more, because of the other radioactive elements that might be in that location. Um, so what I always recommend, and here's the thing, I'll put a link in the description below for this. It's a Geiger counter. I actually showed this in a previous video, but honestly, I wouldn't be caught without one of these if you think there's gonna be any type of nuclear detonation. And of course, because of price gouging, AKA supply and demand, I got mine a long time ago for less than 100 bucks, and this is actually a really good one. And it detects basically how much radiation you're going to have. So if there's a bomb that goes off and my family and I would go to the basement and our fallout shelter and everything, we hang out there for a couple weeks, instead of us saying, hey, I wonder if it's safe to go out, this will actually tell us how much radiation is out there so we can uh, see if it's safe or not. Not safe, let's stay another week or whatever the case may be.
or even more so you do go outside, you can find very specific spots of pockets of uh, hot radioactive material, so stay away from that. And it gives you a bunch of stuff. You can actually hook it to your computer too. It tells you basically the different types of rads you can actually have per hour, what's fatal and stuff. Um, but anyways, I'll put a link in the description below for this. They, they're far more expensive now. Again, I paid less than 100. I think the last I checked now they're $148. But I'll be honest with you, that's worth its weight in gold. I'll say it again, I wouldn't want to be caught without this thing. And furthermore, I actually keep this in a Faraday, a Faraday cage, which the next video on EMPs, I'll discuss how that works, because this is electronic. If there's a nuclear detonation close by or an EMP, this will get fried too. So I want to make sure that I have my Geiger counter in good working condition to be able to check how much radiation there is outside to see if it's safe to go outside, or again, more importantly, to see where directions I might be able to go to see if it actually is safe. Okay, so much more can be said about radiation, but you know, we want to get the basics across in case a nuclear bomb goes off. It's a very basic understanding. Ultimately, if we're gonna classify any radiation that'll cause fatalities, it's gonna be the gamma radiation. It's difficult to shield and can cause the most damage. But you know, here's a general rule to keep in mind. If you don't have the Geiger counter, and this happens to you, just keep this in mind. Radiation sickness, literally feeling sick, vomiting, etc., cetera, um, can actually be indicative of how much of a dose you received. And there's a general rule that we always use in the military, and it's really simple. If you get exposed to some type of radiation, you step outside and there's fallout, and you start vomiting within an hour, you're going to die. Okay? However, if you go outside and the vomiting does take place, but comes on like maybe a couple hours later, it brings your chances up. But the faster you, the faster between you and the radiation and the point you actually start vomiting, you'll have all kinds of other stuff too, mind you nosebleeds, lip sores, uh, hair eventually start falling out. All those things are indicative of radiation poisoning as well. But vomiting, if you see that within an hour, you're in big trouble. But again, obviously it goes past that, you'll actually have more time and a better chance of survival. But again, I would have a guide your counter so you don't put yourself in that position in the first place. But again, the next video is about EMPs. And EMPs are very interesting and I have some really cool facts to talk about that. But that video is gonna be different. As you've seen in this video and the previous ones, I put a lot of technical data out there and talk about prepping and stuff with it. The next video, there's really not a lot that can be said about EMPs themselves. I'll tell you how they work and everything, but even more importantly, we'll definitely go through more about preps and what to do. So I definitely would not miss that video. In fact, the EMP, EMP, the EMP video will not look like the, uh, the same type of thumbnail you'll see for these videos, but you'll, you won't be able to miss it. And I'm probably gonna have that out next week. I would definitely hit that video because it has some pretty interesting and scary stuff about as far as what's gonna happen with a nuclear attack, if it does indeed happen. All kinds of really cool stuff I can tell you about it. All right, but anyways, um, I hope you're getting information out of this and I hope this wasn't too cloudy or too technical based for you um, and be able to look at as far as the radiation goes and how long you may actually be in your shelter. But thanks for following along as I always say and we enjoy you being here. Go ahead and check out this next video and let's keep going in the series.